Hey everybody, welcome to the Faith Church Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Williams, and joining me today is the Right Reverend Dr. Jeff Clossy DDS. Wow, that T-N-T. that was not what I was expecting, but I really do appreciate all those false accolades. <laughs> <laughs> is it wait? Did you lie on your resume, Jeff? Yeah. Well, I didn't think you'd take that seriously. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we we just started a scandal. We just now we just I just blew the lid off of a scandal. And I'll have to it, clean that up church. later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is a great way to start the podcast. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. What, people think? would not expect anything less from us at this point. No. I think a lot of people. There's a lot of apps now that allow you to. So this is a little pro tip for listeners. <laughs> Then allow you to skip a certain number of seconds or minutes of a podcast if you know, like, hey, the first two minutes are. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that have that set up for us. Wait, you can specifically you, say per that? podcast. So if you know, like, your this podcast you listen to, the first two minutes is always like promo stuff that you don't yeah. really care about. Yeah. You can tell it. I don't. Want, I don't need to hear that. So start two minutes in when I listen to it with each individual podcast, like yeah. each show. You can do that. Yep. One. Yep. What? I'll have to show you later. That's amazing. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the beautiful thing about our ramblings at the beginning is they're not. You never know. No. So it's going to be hard to do that. But one of these times <laughs> we're just going to hit the ground running. And so someone who's done that, they're going to like miss, you know, really. All the gems. All the gems. We'll put all the <laughs> gems in the first like two minutes. And then someone like, yeah, that was the worst podcast. Like, really? I thought it was. All right. Well, let's dive in. This is podcast is going to make everyone hungry. What? what? The Great Banquet, man. Oh. I think, at least I'm thinking about my own stomach right now. I'm like, Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about banquet today. Yeah. Should have had my lunch before recording. Yeah. All right. So what do you think? What should we talk about? The banquet? Who's invited? Everybody. Well, I mean, it doesn't say everybody, but But a lot lot of people. (laughs) Yeah. And people had reasons that that they didn't want to come. I mean, I can make a couple observations I have written down here. Well, we got to do something, right? Like we got to, I, I, there was a question, but I, I'd rather, let's talk let's about Let's start the, summarizing it first yeah, and then yeah, let's yeah. get to that question. Um, divided hearts. To me, like one of the key things that, that you brought out on Sunday and that Jesus was teaching through this is divided hearts. And that, I think this is key. This is even, to me, it's one of the reasons he used parables as well when he taught is that, um, Jesus in his, in the way of Jesus in his kingdom, he does not force his ways on us. He does not say you must do this. Although he could, that's what one thing I think is rather amazing. God could compel everyone to come to the banquet and we would have no choice, but, but for some reason he does not, he chooses what, what we have to believe is a better way in inviting us, um, into that. So when it, when it comes to Jesus's teachings, uh, we, we have, a will that we use. We have desires that go into that and, and why, why we will listen to him or not. And I think he does that with parables, but with this banquet, what we see is people are invited in to this celebration and, you know, people give reasons. And I, you pointed out the reasons they gave, it wasn't like I'm going to this entertainment thing or I'm going, you know, something light. It, they were actually like weighty reasons. They're, they're not things that we would be like, Oh, that's a horrible excuse but they still prevented them from enjoying and coming to that banquet. And so to me, I, I think that this again gets down below the surface, below um, merely external conformity to some standard um, to our heart and what is really going on inside of us and our desires. So to me, that's a that's an important point just to begin by talking about that. As you were writing it, I'm curious, Jay, you know, like how how you honed in on, or, or were there things that you weren't able to say, because there always are when we preach, but related to that, related to desire and heart and what's going on within us when we get these invitations. Yeah, I, I mean, there were a lot of things that I cut out. And what's funny is I actually shared them with some people and then I then I forgot what they were. So, <laughs> Well, maybe as we talked, I'll come back to you. <laughs> well, and I... And, <laughs> what what I've always loved about this, and this is one of my favorite parables. So I I really love, and and if people are noticing these these parables about the kingdom, these things we're talking about the 
upside down kingdom, inside out kingdom. And then specifically as we get to the small to big and then everyone's invited. And then next week, the treasure in a field. These are the kingdom parables that drive our philosophy of ministry. Like they, they really get at the, the heart of, of who we are as a church and how we function as a church, because we believe that the way the kingdom comes on earth is the way it's supposed to advance here in our, in our church, right? So we have to remember that what Jesus is doing with all of this is, is calling us to be who God has always called us, his people to be, to be a people set apart, to be a light among the nations. So in the Old Testament, that's what God was calling his people to be. And in the New Testament, that is who God is calling his people to be. Like it's the same invitation in that we are we are meant to be different. We are exiles. We are citizens of another kingdom. And so um, we don't see the kingdom advance the ways that, that they do, that kingdoms of the world advance. So that theme is constantly, um, is, is just constantly being um, declared and illustrated in different ways. And so upside down being about what we value. We don't value the same things that the that the world values. Inside out is we value how it comes about. It's transformational and not top down. It's not, you know, through a dictator, it's not through legislation. Like that's not how transformation happens. It's it's inside out. Um, small to big, like so we don't put our hope in in big splashes and big movements, but in like small faithful acts that those are the things that add up to make something big. And then this this parable really is about how we don't cater to the to the masses. Like it is the masses are invited. I, I what I love about this banquet parable is that it demonstrates, and this is what I tried to point out a little bit was the exclusivity and the inclusivity of the gospel that it is exclusive in the sense that you're you're either all in or you're not like it's all or nothing and and it's a narrow gate and all these different things and and then you have all these people who will never taste the the banquet um but it's inclusive in that the call goes out to everyone like it goes out to the outer edges like this is not this is the opposite of what a banquet in that time would have been. And, and so communicating that, that, that who we gather and who is actually going to come respond to this is, is not, they're not the people that the world would say, oh, that's how you start a movement. Like that's how you advance a kingdom is with the people that are out at the highways and the hedges and the, the byways. Um, but also the exclusivity that those other people, they didn't, it wasn't just like, well, they'll get the leftovers if they show up. It's like, they will never taste the kingdom. And that's a, that's a very exclusive statement that because the guy said, I want to go check out the oxen I just bought. Like that means he's not, he's not fit for the kingdom. And so, um, so that tension but what it also means then for us as a church, like just drawing on that of, of how this is why we don't, um, why we don't have a lot of programs, why we don't beg people to come to things, why we don't chase people down when people like we want everyone to feel like we want everyone to be invited. We want to make everyone feel welcome. Um, but we also understand that a lot of people have a lot of a lot of excuses as to why they are not ready to follow Jesus. And what's always fascinating to me is Jesus doesn't chase those people down. He lets them, he lets them go. And, and so there's a lot in that. Those are some of the things though, as I was kind of honing in on this idea of what does it look like? Who are these people who had excuses? They're ones that had worldly, like they, they were divided. Um, and the ones who had no, like nothing to lose, they were the ones that saw like this invitation is worthy. And so what is it about us that is supposed to get to that place where we, where we see this invitation um, as worthy? And, and then how does that, how does that impact how we actually live this out, how we function as a church? Yeah. It strikes me that in the language that we've been using in this series, you, you know, remember Jesus and politics is these are competing allegiances that these people had and that we all do. Right there, there are things in our life that um, compete for priority, and I love how you put it that the the 
let me just pick up my notebook here. The prerequisite for the banquet is the desire to be there. And that to me, that's, that's significant. And I think it, it changes the way, I mean, so those of us who consider themselves apprentices of Jesus, um, so I think you can make the mistake with this and think, well, that's just when I came to him. This is what this is talking about. And actually, yeah, it includes that, but it's also every day of your life. Um, what will I do today with the word of God? How will I react to the invitation today to live in the kingdom right now and to experience the love and the power and the joy of Christ in, in my everyday life? If I want that, if I want to experience that fullness, that will mean the things that are less than him need to, to remain less than him. So like the way we interact with those competing allegiances, and it's not that these things aren't important. You pointed that out, like the ones from the parable. And then the things in our life, many of them that do compete for for that, it's not that they're unimportant. Our families are important. We are called to love and care for them. Because that was one of the reasons, right? But, but and even as this whole um, passage in Luke continues, it, it gets to the one that, the sayings that get really challenging about anyone who doesn't hate their father or mother cannot follow me. And clearly Jesus isn't calling anyone to hate, but he's calling us to examine who is the, going to be the priority and, and your love for me and your allegiance to me. Everything else in comparison to that will look like hate because I am just first in your life. Um, I think it also really does, like you said, affect the way as a church culture um, we function it has to that the broad invitation and the the heart that is saying you're welcome like we would love for you to be part of this with us but also freeing in the sense that it's not it's not my job to convince you to not go take care of your oxen instead i don't need to be the one that one judges that and decides for you what's more important and I don't need to be the one who either begs you or tries to persuade you or force you in some way. Now, if you ask me, that's different. If someone asks you, give me reasons that I should come. Okay, I'll give you some reasons. But I think that sometimes we live with a burden that is not ours to bear. Does that make sense, Jay? Yeah, and I don't remember if I did end up, if I glossed over that or not. But that was one of the things I was thinking was, like when you're going out and you're just inviting them to come and see, right? And and I used to, so I have to be careful about that. I We aren't a philosophy as a church of like, hey, don't worry about sharing the gospel with anybody. Just invite them to come to the service. That's not what I'm talking about when I say come and see. When you say, when you go out and you invite someone, um, you're not, you might invite them to Sunday morning worship. And we want our Sunday morning worship to be a demonstration of people who are worshiping our King. Like it's not the, it's not primarily, it's not aimed at the non-believer. The non-believer is welcome in our service and we want them to be welcome. We want them to know that we love having them there, but it should be a place where a non-believer is able to observe the church functioning like the church, you know, worshiping Jesus. Um, Rather than a meeting that is that is catered for the person who does not believe. Right. That's right. like it's it's for those of us who believe and everyone else is welcome along. Yes. Which is different, right? That's a different sort of thing. It is different. It it's the it's the difference between like um I mean this is this is off the top of my head, so this may not this may not hold, but I'm go. just thinking I know. Well I'm thinking about like um the difference between like I so I have my oldest just started his first year at college and there's a big difference between a day when you like the tour day, you know, like where they kind of do, Hey, we're going to have a tour group and we're going to go around and we're going to see everything. Um, versus a day where you just go and they just say like, you can tag along with a student and, you know, sit in a class or whatever and go to lunch, but you're just, you're just following them around. You know, the first, they're both valuable, but the first is like aimed at the non-student, right? It's aimed at the prospective student. We want you to to hear all these things. We want you to see all this stuff intentionally. It's all meant, it's all catered to the non-student to show them the school. The second where you're just, you're just going to tag along and shadow another student is that student's going on with their life, right? Like they're in class, they're taking notes. Like it's the professor doesn't care that you're in there. They're teaching. I mean, not that they don't care, but they're teaching the students. You're just observing it. And I think that's, um, 
that's the difference between like you think about an evangelistic outreach versus what Sunday morning worship is. Sunday morning worship is much more like that, like second, where you're a non-believer comes in and they're just kind of, they get to be a fly on the wall and observe people worshiping. And then they get to determine, and, and I don't know about you, but when I was um, choosing a college, it, I was I was much more interested in the second. Like I wanted to know how do you actually function? Yeah. What does it look like when you go to class? What does it look like when you go eat? Like don't don't cater the fancy lunch, you know, with all the other prospective students. And, yeah, it it depends on your wiring, right? The marketing stuff for me was less interesting than what is it like to sleep in this dorm? And right. Yeah, I'll do that. Oh, okay, I now I know more what it's like. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you're highlighting that. That was a good man for at the top of your head. I Thanks. affirm it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but. But I, even what you were saying before that, that led into that, you know, like we could make a mistake here if we do a one-to-one correlation between us, for example, inviting someone to a worship service and an invitation to the great banquet. Mm-hmm. That Those are not right. necessarily no. the same things. No, no. Um, for, for many of people in our life, actually the first step is like getting to know their name and <laughs> doing a little bit of like relational connecting. Yeah. And for some people coming on a Sunday morning would not be helpful for where they're at right now. It just wouldn't, it, it, they wouldn't understand or for whatever reason. Um, so that's different. And I'm glad that you're highlighting that, um, than an invitation to Jesus. That's a very different to the thing. kingdom, right? Like the, yep. yeah, our Sunday morning worship is not synonymous with the kingdom in no. a sense. It is what you talked about last week of it's an embassy. Yes. Right. And so it is a special place where something special happens. Right. Uh, um, but it's, it's not, actually the invitation to the banquet your table like that's what i was trying to point out like your kitchen table is also can be an embassy of that it can be a it's a it's a version of the banquet table our sunday morning can be a version of that but it is it is you know in service of the ultimate you know the the true banquet table which is the kingdom and so i think when we go and when you're inviting someone to come and see, we need to be able to open our minds to the idea of a couple of things. One, we don't, you don't have to have all the answers to all of the things, right? Like you don't have to, uh, to all the questions and all the issues and know how exactly to present the gospel in every certain, you know, every particular way. And, and so that's what paralyzes us so much. Like, well, I, I don't want to share the gospel because what if I what if I don't know the answer to the question? What you are inviting them into when you say come and see may be out to coffee to discuss these things. It may be to a dinner with some of your friends, you know, from from church where you're incorporating them into that. It may be to church on Sunday morning. It may be like there's a lot of different ways, but you're inviting them to what you're inviting them to is to experience and observe the kingdom in all of its forms, right? So inviting them over to a dinner with some of your friends from church is a really great way for them to experience and to see what this what the kingdom is like. It, it should be that. Um, inviting them on a bike ride with some of your, you know, like or inviting them into a inviting them to a Bible study or inviting them just to meet with you to to read the Bible and to like that's all inviting them to the the table. Um and it's so fascinating that when Jesus instructs the disciples on when he sends them out, it he never gives them big theological instructions. He never says like go into the villages and make sure they understand this this and this about the kingdom. He doesn't do that. He tells them go and and give offer peace, and if it's returned to you, then stay. You know, and and then heal heal the sick there. It's so, and even in the Great Commission, the Great Commission does not. He says teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, but he doesn't say like here are the things that you need to make sure they proclaim and that they agree with. You're he's saying go and invite them into the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And even the, I love those examples of when he sends out uh, the 12, then he sends out the 72. And, and uh, I can't remember which reference it is because it's, you know, in multiple places. But in one of them, he does tell them that one of the things they are to say is that the kingdom of God has come near you. And I, in there, and it's like on rejection um, as a, and I'm not suggesting we're doing this, but I'm saying the reality is when we are with people, as a follower of Jesus who in, inhabits his kingdom right now, we need to be aware 
that when we move around and do life, the kingdom is coming near people because he lives in us as his temple. Right. It's really profound reality. And I think it changes the way we walk into a room. It changes the way we grocery shop, all the things, because then we see ourselves purposefully sent into the places that we are. And, and when we realize like to the extent that we can realize that and remember it, I mean, I think for, for most of us, um, hearing the fact that you are an ambassador for the kingdom as you move around, the kingdom is with you. That, that may or may not be new information, but what's, what's real and challenging is, is remembering that and living in that, you know, in the mundane small moments of our lives that don't seem significant. And, but that's where, that's where, and we keep emphasizing that because Jesus emphasized that that's where it's so important. We don't know when it's an important moment. We just don't. No, we really don't. That's what's, that is fascinating when you're, when you're thinking about that. I was thinking about like, and that is a part of the message. I didn't go too deep into the idea of evangelism and what does that look like to invite someone in? Um, and I was just thinking as you were saying that, and that so often we think of evangelism as either a, a sales pitch where I have to have all the right information or a recruiting pitch where I'm trying to get you to show up at this thing, this event. And neither one of those things is actually what evangelism is. Like the proclamation of the good news is, is the proclamation that this kingdom with this king has come. And it is at hand and it has come near to them in the, the bodies, the very bodies of those who believe, those who are part of the kingdom. And you're inviting people to enter into that, to, to, to come and see and to participate in that. And to your point, like that sometimes does mean inviting them to church. That does sometimes mean explaining the gospel. That does sometimes mean inviting them to read the Bible. All of those things are, are, they're, you know, for, I hate to use this phrase, but they're like tools in the toolbox, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're not, but when I say that, the reason why I don't like that phrase is because it feels like, well, because you're trying to like, you're trying to solve this issue, which is typically like, well, they're not a believer and you're trying to make them a believer. And so there's all these different ways you can go about it. That's not the point. Um, It's just, you know, it would be just think, I mean, it's so strange how we, um, how all of a sudden we, we forget how to be like just human beings. And sometimes we, you know, even though we are different than the world, there are things that overlap. And I think it's funny that we are often different from the world in ways we're not supposed to be different from the world. And we're like the world in ways that we're not supposed to be like the world. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that? Well, I mean, we've talked a lot about how we're supposed to be different. So we value different things. We've put our hope in different transformations, small to big, all these things. That's how we're supposed to be different. But there are also ways that we're similar because they are things that are just about what it means to be human. And so everyone who's made in the image of God, for example, desires relationship. Which is everyone. Yeah. Everyone is made in the image of God. And so everyone desires relationship. And one thing that I've noticed is that all of a sudden when we, when we put it in Christian terms, we get really weird about things that we're not weird about in other places. You know, if I'm, if I want to invite someone to a birthday party, that's not weird. I don't, I don't think like, well, how should I invite them? What should I say? What should I like? Well, what if they don't want to come? Like, we don't, we don't think about those things. When you invite somebody to come along with a group of friends to go out to dinner, we don't like freak out about anything. And that just, it feels natural, right? To just say like, Hey, why don't you come with us? Hey, I'd love to. Yeah. We'd love to have you come. Um, when you tell somebody about some great experience you had at a restaurant or something like that, that's very natural. It's only, and, and then when you go hang out at dinner with friends, like if you go out to dinner with friends, you don't sit down and think like, okay, well, who's going to, who's leading the discussion? Who's, who's running point on this? What are we, (laughs) do we know what topics we're going to discuss? How long is this going to take? <laughs> yeah. How long is this going to take? Like, did we, did we allow an hour for this or what did we do? When you go to dinner with friends, you don't need any of that though. But all of a sudden when it, when we attach it to the church, all those things come up, all those things are like, well, what are we supposed to talk about? Who's going to, who's leading the discussion? How long is this going to take? How often should we do this? And it's so, 
it's wild to me that like, well, wait a second, you know how to do that in every other area of your life. Why here do you all of a sudden? Yeah, why here? You know, and the servants is so fascinating when they get sent out. He's like, the master just says, just go get them, compel them to come in. He doesn't say like, okay, well, make sure you tell them what courses are going to be here and like what what we're going to eat and what the program is going to look like or anything like that. It's like, man, come to this party. Why do you think we do that? Why do you think we get so weird when you attach church stuff to it? I, I don't know. I was just thinking that, that that's the question, right? I mean, and it, and it comes to like any sort of spiritual conversation it can be that way. And it's refreshing when it's not. I mean, that's how you can tell that it's normal, that it's weird because when people meet someone who's not that way, it's so refreshing. So any other area, like part of our discipleship to Jesus is that we're learning from him, right? To do things, to know things, to love things. And any other area of our life, if someone was curious about the thing we're learning, so just pick any hobby that you have. And someone was like, so what are you learning about, you know, carpentry lately? Or what are you learning about gardening? It's like the most natural thing in the world to share the things you're learning. And of course you're learning something, but same kind of dynamic. I think if we were like, so what are you learning about Jesus? It just gets so different. And I, there's all kinds of reasons. I do think sometimes um, it's because we are imagining um, that we have more responsibility or more power to make th- something happen with that conversation than we do. I think that's part of it. Like it's, it's what our expectation is. And I do believe, I mean, obviously the topics are different. We feel like there's more at stake with this topic, but I do think it's, it's partly just expectations of the way organizations run versus the way friendships run. So, you know, if we assume that this is an organization rather than just friends that are having a meal, I, I just think we'd bring different expectations to it. I, I don't know what's coming to your mind. I have so many things that it could be, yeah. but I do think yeah. this is an important thing to talk about because, um, one, it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. And, and, if it's not going to be that way, we have to acknowledge that reality and then work on it. But what, what do you think? Well, I think some of it is what we've experienced of when we don't get the kingdom right from an inside out way and small to big way. And what I mean by that is over the years, the church has thought, okay, well, if you want people to like, how, how should Christians function when they're sharing a meal together? And we might think like, oh, well, they would talk about what what God is doing in their life. They would share scripture. We see examples of this in scripture. When they get together, one of you shares, you know, uh, you know, shares a Psalm. Someone shares, you know, a testimony. And, and so we look at that and we say, well, this is what it should look like. Okay. Well then let's, let's formalize that. Let's legislate that. Right. So let's say we're going to give you, this is, this is what you should talk about. This is what you should read. These are the questions you should ask about this thing that you read. And this is how, this is the order of how that should go. Well, when we do that, we are, we are going about it in a worldly way, which is top down outside in. We're saying do these things. And then that'll make you look like what you're supposed to look like. Now, I'm not saying we're doing that with like bad intentions, but that is especially the Western church, how we have functioned for a very long time. What should it look like? Okay, then let's legislate that from the outside in, top down, to make it look like that, which then makes us think this is how it's supposed to be. And so anything that doesn't look like that feels like, oh, we're not doing the thing. Yeah, and am I doing it right? Am that's, I doing that's it right? That's the question then that gets right. like, lodged in our mind. Rather than, like, imagine how different it would be to just, this is what we try to tell people when they get together, like stop worrying about curriculums and stop worrying about all this stuff. Like just get together, open the word of God, share what God is teaching you. And if that feels abnormal, like just keep practicing that, you know, and, and, and just talk to each other. It will become normal. Like it will become like the most natural thing. You and I both have friendships where it's the most natural thing in the world to say, man, I was, reading this in first Corinthians and like, what do you, what do you think about this? Like, I, I, I'm really struggling with this passage. Um, or like I was reading this in Psalms today and it's so beautiful. And I was just really encouraged by it. We just, we have, we did it to ourselves, I guess is basically. And then, and then put the fear uh, and I, it's not the fear of God. It's the fear of man and people, um, that they might do it wrong. 
And, and so then we become so dependent on, say, for example, doing a Bible study with a curriculum, because what if I say something wrong? What if I ask the wrong question? What if I have the wrong answer? And so it just feels safer to us, which is kind of a strange thing, though, because then you're depending on this human author to tell you the finality of that rather than the Spirit of God. So there's that. Right. That feels, and it, <laughs> that strikes, dangerous. it strikes me. So if you, if you apply that to, like, to this parable of the great banquet, right. it's like the servants who are going out with instructions from the master— to invite end up making it primarily about themselves and not the master. And Mm. and that's kind of what happens. And I don't know that we're conscious, like we're not, we're not setting out to serve Jesus, but actually make it about us. But I do think that's a side effect of that model. And that way of thinking is you end up, imagine like in this parable, if they were, you know, there was an addendum and the, the servants are worried about if they're making the invitation properly to all these people. And you know what I mean? And yeah. rather than like, Hey, you're going to want to be here because it's about this, you know, the banquet's going to be amazing. Right. And I love that, by the way, that this is a banquet. And that, I think that's an important thing for us to notice. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. invitation is to something again, that human beings love. Right. Like you didn't, yeah. Didn't invite him to a board meeting. Nope. You know, didn't invite him to <laughs> that. You look moral because you like something no one else likes. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it's not a hipster, uh, something that you 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 make a name for yourself that you are you are i don't know formed in such a way that you like it and everyone else in the world hates it jesus is using something that everyone who heard it would have heard of course i want to be at that banquet right why would you not go to that banquet and we've talked about that treasure in a field and yep. and i think that's important for us that at, to as followers of jesus one that we feel that and we ask him to help us feel that about the kingdom and experience but then when we communicate to others about the kingdom and about Jesus, we need to be able to communicate it in ways that sounds like really good news because it is really good news. And if you're experiencing that good news, then you don't really have to worry about whether you're communicating it as good news. I mean, like again, think about anything that you enjoy. When someone loves fishing, they do not spend a second worrying about how they communicate about fishing to somebody. Yeah, and if you don't care about that thing, right. they aren't offended, but they can't imagine why you wouldn't. They can't, right, exactly. <laughs> why would well, you not care about this? And and they don't and they don't worry about like so yeah, that's a really good when someone I've had people talk to me about fishing and they're like, "Oh, I just love like I get to be alone out on the water and, you know, and and you know, just sitting there and and, and I'm thinking like nothing you just said sounds appealing to me." So guess what? I'm not, I'm not coming, but they don't sit there and go, ah, the problem was I didn't, I probably said it wrong. That was part of what I was trying to get at as far as like, don't be surprised. Rejection is a, is such a part of this. And we automatically assume that there's some way we can communicate the gospel that the masses are going to love. And that was one of the points I was really trying to drive home was that the masses are not going to love it. Jesus is very clear that the masses are not going to love it. So don't be surprised at that and don't try to compromise or try to shape it or manipulate it. If somebody was trying to get me to go fishing, they could start telling me about things that really don't have anything to do with fishing or twisting it just so I would be interested in it. But that's not going to last because the second you get me out then on the water, I'm be like, wait a second. We're just sitting out here. Well, and, and if it, it's like as if you made fishing, just to extend that metaphor. Yeah. But, but, but by the way, I love fishing, so it doesn't take I much. But, but if I was wanting, wanting to get you in the boat and I was like, but Jay, I'll bring your favorite drink and your favorite snacks. Yeah. And that's why you came. Right. That's not going to last. And it's not, it's not, it's not the point. You're, you're like you're never saying gonna, I would eat the snacks right away. <laughs> no. I would 100% eat the snacks right, right. away. And then you're, you're like, like uh, are we done yet? Yep. And that's what I think we do. And everyone's we had make that it about a snack. Right? Oh yeah, everyone's had that experience, especially if you have kids. Yeah, where you're like, hey, come along, we'll we'll do this special thing, and they'll be like, well, when's that thing gonna happen? Because that's why I came. Uh huh. Like you said, we were gonna get ice cream. Can we go get ice cream now? And like, that thing happened, and now I'm done. Yeah. Either that, <laughs> right. And I think, um, so so I, like one part of that is, man, I would love if somebody got out of this conversation right now. Both, just take a step back and think man, what are some of the ways that we act in really weird ways as Christians? And one of them is we don't, we all of a sudden ditch all the things that we know about human relationships and we like formalize it in these weird ways. But then also when we're sharing with people 
about the kingdom. And one thing I want to really point out is evangelism is primarily about an invitation. And that's the thing that I feel like we, like of all the evangelism training that I have been to and seen, like the last thing is invitation. It's, we think of evangelism as communication about a communication of information or about recruiting, but like the invitation part is really, it's, it's not, it's not tell people information. I, I remember feeling convicted a long time ago with the way that I sh- would share the gospel with people that I would share like with my testimony, which was, a you know, for a long time people are, and this is a good thing to do, like share about like how God has impacted your life because people, people aren't going to argue with that. And they're not like, you're just telling them how he's impacted your life. Well, that's great. You know what I realized after a while of doing that? I never offered it to anyone else. And so what I was leaving people with, so for example, I might, if I was meeting with you, Jeff, and I would say, and they might even ask me about my faith and I can tell them like, man, this is how my faith has impacted my life. And I share all the incredible things about the kingdom and about how God had changed me. And then that would be it because I wouldn't want to be pushy. So I don't want to, I don't want to say like, well, do you want this? And what I realized was people, not everyone, but some people, and some people even articulated this, they walked away thinking, oh, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. I wish I could have that. I never invited them. It'd be like telling somebody about this incredible birthday party and like how great it's going to be and how great it was last year. And it's so amazing. And then walking away. Without saying, would you like to come? Right. And then the person's mm-hmm. left thinking, oh, great. You just told me about this amazing experience that is not available to me. And I think we forget that a lot of times people feel like, oh, well, I didn't grow up that way. They assume that the reason why we're experiencing this is because that's the way we were raised. That's what we had. That, Or we're like, you know, a certain type of person or whatever. And they don't actually understand this parable, which is Jesus saying, like, you go out and you tell everybody. Like you go out to, it's, it's the people you would least expect. And so inviting people to come and see, not, not trying to convince. It is interesting. He says, compel them. Yeah. Yep. But I don't think that's not convince them. No, it's not. It's tell, it's, it's, I think when I was talking about the lack of understanding or lack of courage, I think it's making sure like compel them, like you're wanted here. You are invited. Imagine like what that would have been like in that time to be a person who's never invited to anything and now this great, you know, wealthy person who's throwing this big banquet is sending his servants to you. You might think it was like you're being set up for something. You know, you you it would be a it would be a hard sell to convince a person who is out on the outer edges of the society that no you're actually wanted. Come to the table. I think that's the compel. I don't think it's, I don't think it's like, you know, threaten them. And I don't think it's intellectually convince them. I think it's like, make them, make them know that they are wanted at the table. Yeah. And it's, I think the way that we make that invitation. So it, to me, it's not, so the invitation is, well, you probably wouldn't like this. Um, and, but if you've changed your mind, kind of, you know, like that's not compelling. But you, we'd love to have you there. This is going to be great. I really would love for you to come, come. You know, like that. That's yeah. to me. That's the sort of compelling. It's not a. I have backed you into a corner. You have no more arguments. I have. I have won again. Making it about the messenger, and now you're forced to come. None of his disciples followed Jesus because he forced them to. No, he was. He didn't guilt them into it. No. He didn't force them into it. He, it was the best news. I was just reading in the beginning of Luke this morning that just if you read some of the um, prayers, even around Jesus's birth, Mary's prayer and then Zechariah's prayer. And then there's some prophets that show up when he's it, all of them. It's like, this is the best news. The best thing that's happening. You, you cannot keep me out of it. It's, it's like the, the, it says like the, the violent are taking the kingdom of God. Like, and it's like just this unprecedented, a, uh, availability that anyone who wants to come can come and you just can't help but come because it's the best thing there is. And I think that 
that mentality changes the way our spiritual conversations, with, especially with people who are curious, go. That what what we are what we are part of, and the invitation is to something um, that if they could understand it. I remember a question that I used to ask people on campus in campus ministry, and it was always an interesting conversation. We'd be talking about the gospel, and I would say, "If this could be true, would you want it right. to be?" And that to me is it it reveals what a person is understanding as you're having a conversation about spiritual things. Yes. Um, because actually I never had anyone say, no, I don't want that to be true. I never did. That's a really critical thing. And I, it's funny you say that cause I, I use that all the time with people like, mm-hmm. well, just imagine with me for a second that yeah. this is actually true. How would you feel about that? And like you, I've never had anybody say, well, that sounds terrible. If they do, that might be, an indication that you're not actually communicating the gospel well, right? That's what you're saying, you know? Yeah, the things that we're choosing, we're making it sound like the boardroom meeting or, you know, whatever. Right. Or or they just already have assumptions that what you mean is is getting up early on a Sunday morning, going to a thing that doesn't mean anything to me, whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of assumptions. Right. But my point is, I really do, when you read the gospels, people responded because it was the best thing they had heard. No one else had the words of life he had. No one else did the things he did, which was, by the way, a demonstration of the kingdom of God over and over again, alerting people. He reigns. He reigns. He's active. You can be part of it. It was, there was no other option. They yeah. wanted it. It wasn't because they were guilted into it or because if you don't do that, I'm, you know, you're dead to me. <laughs> it's, no. it wasn't that. But imagine, so think about like that invitation then. And I, I'm thinking about, we've all had experiences. I think most of us probably who are listening have been invited to something at some point in our lives. And if you've ever been invited to something, like have you ever been invited somewhere or to something that you're not, you're not sure you belong? Maybe, maybe you feel like, well, they felt like they had to invite you or you just happened to be standing there. Um, or, whatever the case is, but you're just like, ah, like what, what I would love to go, but I feel like maybe I'd be the third wheel or I feel like I, and, and what, what overcomes that is the person, the the person would probably follow up with like, I really want you to be there. It's going to be fun. Like it would be great for you to come. That's the giving courage part that I, like, I think we, we don't realize for people who don't know Jesus and maybe people who haven't, either haven't ever been to church or um, or have not had a good experience in the church, it's really scary. It's really intimidating. You're really like, it's not a, it's not a natural thing for people to just be like, oh yeah, I'll go to this thing I don't know anything about. You know, imagine if somebody invited you to go play pickleball and you don't even know, you've never even seen, anything. you're going to go, uh... I'm terrible at that. I, I'm I'm not athletic. I don't even know what that is. And you say, no, 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 trust me, you're gonna be fine. Like you're what you're doing is giving them courage to realize whatever you're thinking about why you won't fit or why you won't be welcome here, I'm gonna alleviate those fears and let you know, like, no, no, you're you're welcome. Um and it, it can compare that to when we've also, I think, all experienced having an invitation to something that we where we were feeling kind of guilted. You know, like, well, it'd be really nice if you could make it, you know, like everybody else is coming. So why aren't you, you know, you know, maybe it's a family birthday party or something where you're like, oh, or, um, and I, those are not, those are not invitations that are winsome, you know, and, um, and then, or being, or sometimes if you've ever been invited to something where you don't want to come and you say like, Hey, no, thanks. And you know, what, what's the response then? I mean, these are all types of invitations and what, what we want to make sure is when we are inviting people that one, we understand what the kingdom is that we're inviting them into. And that like we, like we already talked about, that might be a Sunday morning worship service. It might be out for coffee. It might be to dinner with your friends. Um, and then, and then understand like, Hey, I'm just, I'm the primary thing is I want you to come and see, come in and experience this. And I think, and we want to give, make people like the thing that I wish we put more of our energy into is making sure people know that they are welcome, 
not that they're going to understand everything, not that they're going to, um, you know, not that there's not a call to follow Jesus, but that, but that they're welcome, that anybody is welcome. There's nothing that disqualifies you. The thing that qualifies you to come is that you want to come and, and then not be surprised that a lot of people aren't like, it's not a desire. And, and our response to that should not be, okay, well, I'm going to come down harder. Like that's where a lot of the evangelism techniques come from is well, we want, I just want to, I want to back you into a corner where you don't have any choice but to agree with this. Like, like we think we can present it in some way that's so airtight that people will be like, oh, I guess that's what I should do. Like that doesn't, that does not work. It's no. never worked. No, it never has. And that happens whenever we're focused primarily on the method of persuasion and not the reality and power of the kingdom. Because when we're focused there, we can still want, we can still present and, and clarify thoughts and answer questions, but then ultimately we realize that what is on offer here um, needs to be desired. And I think that's then, we've been talking about this every week through this series too, but that's when I think we, we should be alerted that we need to be really praying for hearts, right? And that's where we ask God to bring his power to bear upon a heart in a way that we can't. Um, no one, and actually I, if you think about trying to give yourself a desire that you currently don't have, I don't know, try it. It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's really, I don't know if it's even in our power all to do that. And so I, I we ask God, well, anybody do who's that. done sales for a job yeah. knows what that's like. Right. How brutal it is to like try to convince somebody to make a purchase that you would not make. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's not, it's not worth it to you. No. In fact, you might even in the, really the only way you do that is like some people who sell, and they they sell something that they do love and they believe in versus a person who just does it for you know because it's their job. And and I hate comparing evangelism like with with sales, but you're sharing something that is meaningful to you and that you desire, and then you're going to communicate it in a way that is desirable. It's but we aren't in control of whether somebody wants that or not, right? And I think my hope is. When I just think about our church, I just think, man, it would be so incredible just to get that idea of being sent out by the master to just go and and to invite people to come in and not worry about how um, how close they seem to to being. You know, like that's one of the things I I've heard people use that phrase. I've used that phrase like, oh, they're so close. Like, what does that even mean? Like, a lot of times for us, it means, oh, they're like they they're living a a moral life you know or they seem to be you know have similar views to what you know scripture has on certain issues or whatever like they're so close and they seem kind of interested in my experience when somebody like comes to the to the table like it does not matter i mean how 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 close they seemed like they were is totally irrelevant and I'm assuming that's been like your experience as it well. Is. It is because I've I've experienced over and over that people that others have written off are actually much closer to the kingdom than we realize, you know, and, and they come to Jesus. So, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think our ability to gauge that is flawed. Um, so, yeah. which, I mean, well, by the way, like a lot of times people worry about, Oh, I, I get this question a lot from people of, especially if it's a family member or a friend I've invited them and they always have said no. And so I just don't want, I don't want to keep pushing them. Like, I don't want to keep like, you know, I feel like a broken record or whatever. And my, my recommendation in that usually, if you have a friend or family member that you've been praying for and you've been, you've shared with them what God has done in your life and they know that and you offer to, you know, pray for them and maybe they come to you and they ask for prayer sometimes. My, my encouragement usually is, hey, every once in a while, when, when you do have any of those conversations, just remind them like, hey, you know, you're welcome. Like, I, so how that works for me sometimes is with friends who be like, Hey, I know you're a praying person. Would you, would you pray for me? Sometimes I will say to them, like, I'm happy to do that. And just so you know, like this is available to you too. Like mm -hmm. if you, if you want to also have this, like I, yes, I will pray and I know God hears my prayers, but it's not because of who I am. It's because of who he is. And, and you, you can have that 
like it's just like a reminder of you know you're still invited like yeah i like that a lot because sometimes people feel like well i already said no to that and then they feel like well that that door is closed and i think and you see jesus do that he's constantly like he'll he'll throw the line out again and nicodemus is a good example we think of that joseph of arimathea we're not 100 percent sure like who there's there are these different like through church history people who originally rejected his own brother you know like people when we get these finality of like the parable it's important to remember like jesus is talking big picture here so he's not saying once a person says oh i don't have time for that right now then that means they are always like shut out that's not the point it's it's a point of ultimate you know kind of big picture ultimately that's what they have determined but there are, are all of us at some point or another have like not been ready for what Jesus has called us into. And then later we were ready. So yep. like, don't give up on people. That's not the point of this. It's not like, well, you know, shake your dust off and never talk to them ever again. But what it does mean is our pursuit of people is meant to be just a love your neighbor as yourself, not a like trying to convince them. And like, every time you talk to them, if you feel like I didn't present the gospel to them, then I failed because I didn't, you know, wear them down. <laughs> I didn't wear it. You know, like, it's not that it's, I think every once in a while, just reminding like, Hey, you know, you're welcome. You know? Yeah. That, that's a good way of saying it too, because, um, it doesn't require them to say no. Right. You know what I mean? So you're not putting them over and over in a situation. Cause no one wants to say no, even if they think the invitation's horrible. Most people would right. rather not say no, but saying, Hey, you're welcome. They can say, okay, thanks without having to say no. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that phrasing Jay and that's good. And I think if we're listening to the spirit, this is where it's so critical to be listening to the spirit in that I've had times in my life where I have felt compelled to push a little harder on the invitation in that situation where I say, Hey, you know, you're welcome. And I might get like a, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. There have been times where I have felt, I think led by the spirit. I hope led by the spirit where I felt compelled to say, Hey, why don't you come with me? What? Come on Sunday. Yep. And, um, and then there are other times where I haven't felt compelled to do that. It was, it was enough to just let them know. And some of that's based on their response. Like you can kind of tell a lot of times when somebody's like, that is actually really intriguing. I think I would like to come to that, then they might need a little extra, like a direct invitation. And then there are other times where people are like, thanks buddy. You know, and you're like, okay, yeah, you're not, you know, or when somebody says, oh, I w- I'd love to, but like, you know, this is just a busy season. Well, that's part of what Jesus is declaring here. And you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm not going to make them feel guilty for that. I'm not going to like, no, you know, well, if you really cared about this, then you would like, well, okay. But and 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 leave it, not leave them. It. Like I think right. the point isn't <laughs> that that's that's a, a, that's a mistake, right? I mean, it is. It's and it's an important one. It's not that the person is only valuable if they respond to the invitation. They're valuable, right, forever. And and they are hopefully friends, no matter what they respond. We love and we care and we pursue them. And um, I think it can sometimes be like a sadly when when all of this goes awry like we've been talking it can be like someone who has a romantic interest in someone else and as soon as that person says no i'm not interested in that they're like i have no use for you in my life and i think that can happen with evangelism it can happen with all this and you know so insofar as we are living in the kingdom and loving and pursuing people in the ways of jesus that will not happen because they are valuable to us and they're valuable to him no matter how they respond to us in those moments. Like you said, it's not, I'm glad you drew that out. This is not a literal one-time thing. Uh, it's a process and a whole life that's lived with people. Yeah. So in conclusion, hopefully I didn't think this was going to go in like evangelism training, but I think it's, I think it's helpful. And, you know, if you have questions about that, let us know on this, but, um, you know, from this parable as it pertains to that, to sharing our faith, just a reminder that everyone is worthy of the invitation. And we want to model that in the church. It's why we, we like I said, we don't we don't beg for things. We, we let people know, like we invite them into things. And if they want, like what makes a person worthy is their desire. Think about that. Like when we, um, 
you know, even volunteering and things like VBS and everything. Like what makes someone worthy of helping is not how skilled they are, you know, at whatever the job is. It's that they want, you know, want to be there. And yeah, obviously we have some things that are like require a certain level of, you know, skill. Like it'd be hard to preach if you don't have command of the English language. That's a, you know. Yes. Probably challenging. That. Certainly it'd be hard to be on the worship team if you don't have any musical ability that becomes like a, you know, stowing block, but you don't have to have music. Well, and I always hate using that example because the whole congregation is the worship team, right? And you don't have to have any musical ability to be a part of that and to, to sing. And like, I think one of the most beautiful sounds is the tone deaf person singing in worship. I love it. I like, I love it. And, and so I think just being reminded of that, that everyone is, invited and then what makes them worthy of coming is just their desire to come so that should take a lot of pressure off of us as we go and we get to declare this incredible kingdom and that to let people know that they are also welcome to come to the table and then not be surprised when we're we're the minority like it's just the it's the reality of living as exiles in in a, a place that is not our home You know, if I was, when I, when I lived in California, I was not surprised that I wasn't surrounded by Iowa Hawkeye fans. It didn't surprise me. Like lots of people that there, and, and when you're not living in your home, like if you were right now, we have like Bears fans that are here. They're not surprised that everyone's wearing Packers jerseys. They don't come, you know, they don't go out to Walmart on Sunday and be like, what in the world? Why are, why aren't there more Bears jerseys? Like there just aren't. And um, and that's such a small, silly, insignificant thing to try to point to something that is way more important. But we should not be surprised when we live in the world that we are not of the world and that our allegiance is not to the kingdoms of this world, but to our King Jesus. And we are living as exiles, as strangers in a land. So that's not surprising. But we also have the great privilege of being able to declare this kingdom that has come and is coming again to be fully established and that everyone is welcome at the table. Anyone who wants to come is welcome at the table. Amen. All right. Well, I feel like we did enough there. Yeah, we did. Okay. We did have a Thanks, question, Jim. but they'll actually be addressed in this sermon okay. next week, and then we can talk about it next week. But we hope that this has been helpful to you and encouraging. Um, as always, we want to encourage you. We are not meant to do this alone. Um, so please reach out and we want to help you get connected. You can email us at connect at faithpeshtigo.com or talk to us on a Sunday morning. Until next time, grace and peace.